1948, the Presley family, seeking better opportunities, relocated to Memphis. They left Tupelo in a packed 1939 Plymouth with Elvis's paternal grandmother, Minnie Mae, in tow. Elvis, echoing the words of a Steinbeck character, later recalled, We were broke, man, and we left Tupelo overnight. Daddy packed our belongings and put them on top and in the trunk of the car. We just headed to Memphis. Things had to be better. Upon arrival in Memphis, Vernon found work loading cans in a paint factory, but a bad back soon forced him out of action. Gladys, on the other hand, reveled in her role as a hospital orderly, her friendly and sympathetic nature making her a natural fit for the job. She was even encouraged to pursue nurse training, though she ultimately decided against it. The Presleys lived in a housing project, sharing a single room with a toilet down the hall. Despite the cramped living conditions, Elvis continued with his schooling while also working at a local cinema. Memphis, with its vibrant blues music scene, had a profound impact on Elvis. He became infatuated with the blues, frequenting Beale Street and absorbing the culture and fashion. A particular favorite was Lansky Brothers, a gents outfitters that opened in 1946. Elvis's first purchase from the store was a white tuxedo for the school prom, but his true passion lay in bright colors. A photograph of him in a blue jacket with a brown collar captures his eclectic style, and he was particularly fond of the combination of pink and black, a preference that extended to his beloved Cadillacs. Bernard Lansky, a master salesman at the store, remarked on Elvis's unique style, saying, everything suited him. Elvis's distinctive appearance, coupled with his growing musical talent, would soon set him on a path to stardom. In the halls of Hume's High School, a young Elvis Presley stood out, not for his stature or athletic prowess, but for his unique talent, his voice. While others may have teased him for his differences, his loyal friend, Red West, stood as his protector. Elvis's ability to sing was undeniable, and his rendition of Old Shep and his solo performances in Christmas carol concerts showcased his natural gift. However, when it came to academics, Elvis's report card painted a grim picture. He struggled in English and American history, while his best subject was woodwork. The path of a carpenter seemed to beckon, echoing the footsteps of another iconic figure. Vernon Presley, Elvis's father, sensing the practicalities of life, advised his son to pursue a career as an electrician, dismissing the notion of a successful guitar player. This advice mirrored the sentiment expressed by Aunt Mimi to John Lennon, emphasizing the financial uncertainty of a musical career. Despite the doubts and challenges, Elvis Presley persevered. He graduated from Hume's High and embarked on a series of jobs, including a stint as a cinema usher and a position at Precision Tools. Eventually, heeding his father's counsel, he found employment at Crown Electric, a small electrical company in Memphis. Initially, he worked as a deliverer man, driving the same truck that had once carried the aspiring singer Johnny Burnett. Intriguingly, an article attributed to Elvis Presley appeared in the Radio Luxembourg Book of Record Stars in 1962. In this piece, Elvis claimed to have secured a job at a defense plant for a dollar an hour. The veracity of this account remains uncertain, and it could potentially refer to a factory involved in the Korean War or a lingering term from World War II. In the same article, Elvis shared a poignant memory of his relationship with his mother, Gladys. He recalled how he could wake her up in the middle of the night to confide in her worries. She would respond with unwavering support, preparing him a sandwich and a glass of milk while they talked. This quote exuded a sense of genuine love and connection between mother and son. In the heart of the music-rich town of Florence, Alabama, a young man named Samuel Cornelius Phillips was born on January 5, 1923, destined to become a legendary record producer. Fate placed him near the iconic Muscle Shoals, where the musical currents flowed strong. Sam's journey began as an announcer and radio engineer in Decatur, Georgia, and Nashville, Tennessee, where he honed his skills with recording equipment, preparing him for his future endeavors. Driven by a passion for capturing the raw and authentic sounds of black musicians, Sam embarked on a groundbreaking venture in January 1950. 
He established the Memphis Recording Service, a humble studio nestled on Union Avenue, just a stone's throw from the vibrant Beale Street. He found willing partners in the Chess Brothers Chess label and the Bihari Brothers Modern and RPM labels, leasing his recordings to these industry giants. Sam's distaste for the bland music of his time fueled his desire to preserve the gut bucket sounds that resonated with the black community. He wanted his studio recordings to exude the electrifying atmosphere of a live band performing on Beale, a place where the music flowed like molten lava. Legend has it that the uneven ceiling of his studio contributed to the unique acoustics, adding an extra layer of character to the recordings. Fate brought Ike Turner's Kings of Rhythm Band, featuring his talented cousin Jackie Brinston, to Sam's doorstep. On March 5, 1951, they laid down a track that would forever change the course of music history, Rocket 88. This high-octane, largely instrumental song, punctuated by three short vocals, pulsated with an energy that Sam boldly proclaimed as the first rock and roll record. Of course, Sam's declaration carried a hint of self-promotion, but there was no denying the revolutionary nature of this recording. As fate would have it, the band damaged an amplifier during transit, causing it to buzz incessantly. Surprisingly, Sam embraced this flaw, believing it added a distinctive edge to the sound. However, internal tensions arose within the band as Ike Turner chafed at his subordinate role. Little Richard, a musical icon in his own right, couldn't help but be captivated by the raw power of Rocket 88. He unabashedly borrowed the song's infectious riff, incorporating it into his own electrifying performances. With a vision to create a label that would showcase the raw talent of these genres. He established Philips International in 1950. However, his initial release, Gotta Let You Go, by the enigmatic one-man band Joe Hill Lewis, failed to gain traction. Undeterred, Phillips persisted, driven by a burning desire to succeed and a belief that he was doing God's work. As the years passed, Phillips' ambitions grew. He observed the success of labels like Chess and Bihari and felt a sense of urgency to establish his own empire. Determined to take control of every aspect of the music-making process, from recording to manufacturing and distribution, he launched Sun Records in 1952. His first release under the Sun label was a slow-burning instrumental titled Drivin' Slow by the teenage saxophonist Johnny London. The track's atmospheric sound, featuring London's haunting saxophone melodies echoing through a seemingly empty corridor, captivated listeners and hinted at the musical magic that would soon emerge from Sun Records. Ironically, the first major success for Sun Records had an indirect connection to Elvis Presley. Phillips saw an opportunity to capitalize on the popularity of Big Mama Thornton's hit single, Hound Dog, and recorded an answer version with an up-and-coming local talent. Little did he know that this decision would pave the way for the rise of a music icon and usher in a new era for Sun Records. In the realm of music, a tale of rivalry and creativity unfolds. Big Mama Thornton, a force to be reckoned with, captivated audiences with her bold and powerful performances. Yet, her path collided with Sam Phillips, a determined record producer seeking to make his mark. Phillips, inspired by Thornton's raw talent, pinned a song that would become an anthem of defiance, Hound Dog. The song, infused with bluesy rhythms and a touch of novelty, was meant to convey a resounding message. Thornton, however, was not one to be dictated to. She resisted Phillips' attempts to mold her performance, refusing to growl as he instructed. This clash of wills led to a standoff, with Thornton standing her ground and Phillips determined to have his way. John Stewart, a rising star at the time, recalled his fascination with the song. Traveling to downtown LA to seek out the record in a black record shop, the success of Hound Dog reverberated through the music world, influencing countless artists and shaping the trajectory of rock and roll. British musicians like Eric Clapton immersed themselves in the blues, drawing inspiration from the genre's rich traditions. In the wake of Thornton's triumph, Phillips wasted no time in crafting an answer version, Bearcat. He enlisted Rufus C. Thomas Jr., a Memphis disc jockey, to bring the song to life. Thomas embraced the opportunity, 
recognizing the potential of the track. However, the release of Bearcat sparked a legal battle. Don Roby, the owner of Peacock Records, to which Thornton was signed, claimed copyright infringement. Phillips, known for his tenacity, found himself outmatched by Roby's formidable presence. Thornton, determined to reclaim her creative autonomy, responded with her own answer versions, I smell a rat, and just like a dog, barking up the wrong tree. These songs served as a testament to her resilience and her refusal to be silenced. In 1984, alcoholism tragically claimed the life of Rufus Thomas, a renowned singer and entertainer. His follow-up single, Tiger Man, showcased a unique blend of originality and familiarity, echoing the success of Elvis Presley's Hound Dog without directly imitating it. While it failed to gain immediate recognition, Elvis Presley himself recognized its potential, ensuring its eventual success. Unbeknownst to many, Johnny Bragg's path to music was paved with adversity. At the tender age of 17, he endured a heart-wrenching betrayal when he caught his girlfriend in the arms of his best friend. In a desperate attempt to explain her bruises to her parents, she falsely accused Bragg of rape. The police, without hesitation, subjected him to a brutal beating until he reluctantly signed a confession. Even after the girl recanted her story, Bragg found himself facing charges for six additional rapes. In a cruel twist of fate, he was found guilty of all charges and sentenced to six consecutive 99-year prison terms, amounting to a staggering 594 years. Bragg's journey continued within the infamous Tennessee State Prison, where he was assigned to the task of making prison clothes. When the authorities deemed his work insufficiently swift, they subjected him to a harrowing punishment. They tied him to a ring suspended from the ceiling and mercilessly beat him unconscious with their leather belts. Despite the unimaginable horrors he endured, Johnny Bragg's spirit remained unbroken. Blessed with a naturally gifted tenor voice and an innate sense of harmony, he found solace in singing. Inspired by the spirituals sung by fellow prisoners, Bragg recognized the potential for a well-ordered vocal group. He formed the Prisoneries, a group of talented convicts who serenaded prisoners facing the ultimate punishment. Bragg would often stay behind to loosen the straps of the condemned men and clean up the aftermath of their execution. His unique approach to songwriting earned him the nickname Buckethead. Bragg would place a bucket over his head to simulate an echo effect, creating haunting and evocative melodies. His talent caught the attention of Nashville stars who occasionally performed at the prison. One such encounter with the legendary Hank Williams left an indelible mark on Bragg. He boldly approached Williams and asked, Do you think I'll ever get out of here? In the heart of the Tennessee State Penitentiary, a remarkable musical journey unfolded. Hank Bragg, a talented songwriter, and Robert Riley, a burglar, found themselves strolling through the rain-drenched courtyard. As they pondered the whereabouts of the girls, Riley uttered, That's a song. Within minutes, Bragg had crafted two verses, believing he had struck gold. Being illiterate, he sought Riley's help in pinning the lyrics, offering a writing credit in return. Their creation, Just Walkin' in the Rain, captured the essence of longing and curiosity. As fate would have it, the Democratic politician Frank Clement, Tennessee's youngest governor, appointed James Edwards as the new warden. Edwards, upon hearing the prisoners' harmonious voices, recognized the potential for positive change. In an unprecedented move, he allowed the inmates to perform under armed guard at churches, civic functions, and even on local radio. The success of the song ignited a creative spark within the prison walls, inspiring inmates to write and perform their own music. Phillips, with his keen ear for talent, discovered two more gems among the white inmates, Without You and Casual Love Affair. These songs would later be rehearsed with none other than Elvis Presley, the rising star of rock and roll. Meanwhile, the renowned Johnny Ray had picked up on Just Walkin' in the Rain, further solidifying its place in the annals of music history. In 1953, Sam Phillips, a man with an adventurous spirit, took a gamble on a young musician named Little Junior and his Blue Flames. He recorded an original song, Mystery Train, credited to Herman Parker, Little Junior, and Phillips himself. 
Though it was likely written solely by Parker, the song borrowed heavily from the Carter family's 1930 track, Worried Man Blues. Phillips' releases showcased his willingness to push boundaries, but he was plagued by doubt and debt. To make ends meet, he ventured into local recordings. In an era before mass-produced tape recorders, most Memphis residents had never heard their own voices. Phillips capitalized on this with his slogan, We record anything, anywhere, anytime. For a mere $4, anyone could sing two songs and receive a 10-inch 78 RPM acetate recording. Phillips even extended his services to church events, such as weddings and funerals, as well as other location work. Phillips saw this venture as a way to streamline his search for new talent. He knew that local singers would be eager to hear themselves, and he could evaluate their abilities while charging them a small fee. He took pleasure in assisting and encouraging these aspiring musicians, helping them to believe in their own talents. While such recording services were common at fairgrounds, it was unusual for professional labels to offer them. As fate would have it, another visionary in the music industry, Ahmet Erdogan of Atlantic Records, was also experimenting with local recordings around the same time. These innovative approaches would eventually revolutionize the music industry, paving the way for a new era of self-expression and discovery. In the heart of Liverpool, Percy Phillips, known as Mr. Phillips, offered a unique service just outside the city center. The Quarrymen, who would later become the legendary Beatles, recorded two tracks there in mid-1958 for an incredibly low price of 17 shillings and six pence. Elvis Presley, captivated by the sign, wondered how his voice would sound if he recorded it. He admired the music of Sun Records, but yearned to emulate the style of Dean Martin. Dean's lazy, slurred delivery, particularly in his 1950 hit, I Don't Care If The Sun Don't Shine, resonated with Elvis. Sinatra's talent was undeniable, but Dean's effortless approach intrigued Elvis. It is said that the record was intended as a birthday present for Elvis's beloved mother, Gladys. The song choices were fitting for her, but her birthday fell in April. However, there was a practical reason behind the recording. Elvis's friend, Ed Leake, whose father was a doctor, provided him with $4, hoping that the song could be played on local radio. On July 18, 1953, the 18-year-old truck driver, clutching his guitar, stepped through the doors of Sun Records, eager to hear his voice for the first time. Sam Phillips, the founder of the label, wasn't always present at the studio at 706 Union Avenue, but that didn't matter because his secretary, Marion Kiesker, was skilled in operating the recording equipment. Who do you sound like? She inquired. Elvis, with his characteristic humility, replied, I don't sound like nobody. Was Elvis being modest or boastful? It's likely that he was simply being modest, but one can never be entirely sure. When he recounted this story to Hollywood reporter Dane Marlowe in 1956, he added, I was a teacher's pet at school and didn't know how to be modest. The recording process was straightforward and unforgiving. As Elvis sang, the machine cut the record, leaving no room for corrections. There was no pressure, but the anticipation was palpable. In 1953, a young man named Elvis Presley stepped into a recording studio in Memphis, Tennessee, eager to make his mark in the music industry. With $4 in his pocket, Elvis approached Marion Kiesker, the studio's receptionist, and requested to record a song. As the lathe swung into operation, Elvis poured his heart into two songs, My Happiness, a popular tune from 1948, and That's When Your Heartaches Begin, a classic from 1937. His voice, sweet and professional, soared through the studio, carrying a slight falsetto that would soon become his signature sound. Marion, impressed by Elvis's raw talent, made a note, good ballad singer. When Sam Phillips, the studio's owner, returned, she couldn't resist telling him about the kid with the sideburns. Elvis's recording of My Happiness remains a hidden gem, a testament to his early potential. Though he never recorded the song again, its release in 1959 by Connie Francis proved to be a financial lifeline for its songwriter, Betty Peterson, 
who was struggling due to family illness. That's when your heartaches begin, however, it didn't fare as well. Elvis's high-pitched start and deep-voiced narration, which some perceived as drunken, hindered the song's success. Only one copy of Elvis's recording is known to exist. In 2015, Jack White, formerly of the White Stripes, purchased the rare acetate for a staggering $300,000. Jack had previously portrayed Elvis in a cameo appearance in the Johnny Cash satire, Walk Hard, The Dewey Cox Story. As Elvis left the studio, Marion Kiesker's words echoed in the air, Good Ballad Singer. Little did she know that this young man with the sideburns would soon become the king of rock and roll, leaving an indelible mark on the world of music.